All right, so we're going to talk about uh, AMR analysis this morning. Uh, we'll do a lab uh, on it. Now, there's a, a large diversity. You've read the paper, so hopefully, large diversity of software and tools. Um, we're going to pick two to really gen to illustrate first principles. And the lecture I'm going to give is really about what the core things you need to worry about and think about in AMR analysis when you use any particular uh, tool. So our objectives, we're going to review the available antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance resources. Uh, we're going to take a look at the card, which is uh, what my, my group uh, creates. Uh, but really, when you talk about AMR analysis, you've got to think about mechanism. So the type of mechanism influence the analysis. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to look at both doing genomic and metagenomic data. When it comes to AMR, genomic is doing much better than, than metagenomic. We're in early days of predicting AMR from metagenomic data. So a little background. Uh, not everyone is uh, an AMR person. Right, so bacteria are evolving resistance faster than we can bring new drugs to market, right? And we have completely or virtually untreatable strains such as gonorrhea. So in the last five years, out of one high school in the UK, a strain's gone global. We have untreatable TB uh, as well. Uh, this is the UK review on antimicrobial resistance. So right now we have about 700,000 global deaths uh, by AMR. The review predicted by 2050, we could be up to 10 million deaths. I added a few citations. This is an economic assessment. Not everyone agrees with these numbers and the effects, so there, I put some counterexamples. But these are large numbers, right? So we're looking at a large amount of death. Not only death, but you lose a lot of modern surgery. So if you can't control infection, you can't do hip replacement. You can't use chemotherapy, right? You can't use uh, routine uh, transplant surgery. So just general medicine is under threat with, because of antimicrobial <laughs> resistance. The key thing is we're not dealing with brand new bugs, right? We're, we're for the most part with bugs that we know well about, right? So things like TB, right? With, with, when you reach an untreatable strain, you're thinking about going back to the iron lung. Enterobacter, uh, staph, every 10 year goes by, staph suddenly knocks out another uh, class of drugs that won't work for it. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, an opportunistic pathogen. So CF patients who get fluid in their lung pick up pseudomonas from multiple sources. Uh, the clap, mysteria gonorrhea, right? So the issue of you know safe sex becomes increasingly important again. So it's not only evolutions at work because of what we're doing uh, to create resistance, but while we're doing that, we're not finding new drugs. So the pipeline of production of antibiotics has been just drying up, right? So really, other than one or two, we haven't found any major drug class since the 80s, right? So the low-hanging fruit, the easy-to-find compounds have been found. Now it gets expensive and it's hard. As a result, there's really only two companies that are significantly putting money into antimicrobial R&D, right? So this is just a rapid drop of investment. Uh, there's issues over patent time. There's issues over profit models. So you have less and less players bringing new drugs to market, and those drugs are really hard to find and get to, to through clinical trials. So how does antibiotic resistance happen? speaking to the, the choir, so to speak. So it really comes down to misuse or abuse of antibiotics, right? So misuse, patients not finishing their runs, uh, not using the right concentrations or times, but misuse using antibiotics as growth stimulants in agricultural settings, uh, using the wrong antibiotics to do so, ones that are supposed to be held in reserve being used in agricultural settings. All of these create a selective environment that cause resistance. So resistance is a genetic thing. This is done by DNA. So resistance, the drugs themselves target different aspects of the cell. So they could uh, attack the cell wall, right? The viability of the cell wall. They could attack the informatics machinery, so DNA and RNA synthesis. They can attack a aspects of the biochemistry, folate synthesis, an example, the protein synthesis. Uh, all these things that drugs can attack, but each one of those targets, there's a resistance mechanism against. So you can make the cell impermeable. So the, the drug can't get in. You can protect the target by mutating the target or attaching something to the target. You can make an enzyme that just chews up the drug. And most commonly, you could use efflux to spit out the drug as fast as it comes in. All these are genetic uh, determinants. The other key thing is that threats emerge quickly. So my lab is really a threat lab. That's how we think about things. So this is the NDM1 case. Who knows about NDM1 a little bit, right? Okay, so the NDM1 is a, a gene, a beta-lactamase plasmid born that knocks out carbapenems, right? Uh, particularly one of our two classes of, of last resorts drugs. So this was literally came down to one Swedish individual, 
in India, 2006, got ill with a gut infection. That bacteria had picked up this gene, Lord knows from where, somewhere in the environment, right? Maybe it was rotating in clinical settings already. That one patient ended up being flown to the UK for treatment. It got into the UK hospital. So one person, one suite. If there's a nation there that has color on it, that's where NDM1 is detected and being monitored. Canada has an NDM1 problem as well uh, to it. So one person, rapid spread of a gene that takes out one of the two major drug classes of last resort. Right? So these things can happen very quickly. So you could ask which resistance genes are in Canada, which genes are moving around, and which one poses threat. That's a different question to ask what kind of resistance do we see in Canada. That's a phenotypic question. We have good numbers on that. What's the rate of beta-lactams not working or aminoglycosides not working? We have that level data. We often are missing the data of what's causing it. Because there could be 30 or 40 different genes causing aminoglycosides. Which ones are at play? Now with sequencing, we can start to fill in that gap around that data. So let's back up. Uh, think about from threat. So I know it's old enough. This is Donnie Rumsfeld. He was the Secretary of Defense for George W. Bush. He had this great quote, uh, there are known knowns, things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns, that is, there are the things we know we don't know. But there are also the unknown unknowns, the things we don't know that we don't know. Right? He took a lot of criticism for this, but he was actually quoting Black Swan theory. This is a theory of how you look at threat. And particularly, Black Swan looks at you know, world-ending type of threat. You could argue that antibiotic resistance is not that scale, but it's certainly frightening enough. But when we look at software developers and bioinformatics, this is the perspective I want you to take when you're looking at AMR data. So, unknown knowns. So these are the genes and pathogens we're tracking. So in public health labs, we have PCR assays, we have other different, we have uh, culture assays for specific genes and specific pathogens. It's a pretty short list, right? So there's about three to 4,000 AMR determinants out there. If you go to public health lab in Ontario, we got about 40 PCR tests for the most common threats. What about the known unknowns? Well, these are the genes that are in the literature that we know about, but we're not building assays for. We're not testing uh, in the laboratory. Or they're variants of known genes. So we know the aminoglycosides we've characterized aren't the only ones, or aminoglycoside acetyltransferases we've characterized aren't the only ones out there in nature. We know there's sequence variants, and we don't know how functional they are. Do they have a higher or lower MIC? But we know this is a problem. There's lots that we don't track. Travel makes this an issue. Maybe we're not tracking one because we don't expect it in our neighborhood. Then travel brings it into our neighborhood. Then there's the unknown unknowns. These are the emergent threats. Uh, so Gary's going to give the last one of the last sections of the workshop about emergent pathogens. Well, emergent threats, these are the things that are coming out of the water, out of soil, basically out of the environment, maybe working their way through agriculture before they get to the clinic, but somehow they're, they're getting to us. And we don't know a heck of a lot about them. So two of them, NDM1 in 2006, so that took out carbapenems. So if you have a plasmid with this uh, gene, you lose your carbapenems. The other drug class of last resort is the polymyxins, or colistin, uh, for example. So in 2015, another uh, gene was reported from China called MCR1. We now know from retroactive sequencing from freezer collections that China wasn't the source. It was in Canada 2008, I think, is the last estimate. Where's Gary? He's not here yet on that. Um, but if you've got... That one, you've lost colistin and polymyxins, and roughly three months ago in the U.S., we had a young woman who had a plasmid with both. It was untreatable and died, right? So these are emergent threats. Are they common in day-to-day -day sequencing and epidemiology? No, but we don't want a lag time either. We don't want to find six months after the fact why the colistin stopped working. We'd rather have algorithms to detect it right off the bat, right, when that pathogen gets sampled in a clinical setting. All right, so the sequence we talked about already, DNA sequencing, so the genes can no longer hide, right? We're, we now have first revolution we can take advantage of, sequencing getting faster, cheaper, smaller. So we can sample at high throughput with high quality and start to look at these genes. So from a bioinformatic perspective, this is really a, a four-step process. We sequence, so we get an isolate, or maybe it's a gut sample, a metagenomic sample. And that has to be compared to reference sequences. You need a point of reference to say, ah, you're NDM1, you're MCR1, you're an efflux protein. From that catalog, we can predict resistome, the catalog of resistance and gene mutations in our sample. Those first three work pretty well. The last one's a lot harder. When I've got that sequence data, can I predict phenotype or antibiogram? Right? So a subtle difference in there. Phenotype is really what a cell biologist thinks about. Antibiogram is what a clinician thinks about. What drug should I use next? What drug should I avoid? Right? That's a big jump, that last part. We're going to talk a little bit about that. 
So the key part is you need this comparison to reference sequences. So a large part of AMR analysis is about biocuration. So there are many databases. There's a, about three or four of us that are quite large. We collaborate. We compete. It's that type of ecosystem. Uh, so this is the CARD, the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database. Uh, we're going to do a little bit. So this is my group. I'm embedded with drug discovery. I'm like a biologist, so I serve that community. But we work increasingly with ARIDA and public health uh, perspectives. So CARD really has, uh, pardon me, three components. We have a knowledge base you can browse. We're going to do a bit of little, little of that in the lab. Uh, we have downloads, so the data in many formats, so you can run your own analysis and pipelines uh, to it, so you don't have to use our software, for example. And we have analytical tools to analyze uh, sequence data. CARD is an actively curated database. Every 30 days, we put a, an update. They're rarely trivial. Summer gets a little slower. The students take off a lot, but uh, we're going to put a lot of software this summer. So what is CARD? So we really focus on curation of a gold standard reference molecular sequence data. We need really good data for comparison when we sequence a sample, right? Uh, for the antibiotics, their targets, their mechanisms, their genes, and their mutations, conferring resistance. So it's a lot of information. Uh, we organize it all by using the antibiotic resistance ontology. So Fiona gave a little hint on ontologies last night. This is, uh, well, over 3,000 terms. We have the, a lot of biology that we need to encode to put in a framework both a human and a computer can use. And we're going to talk a little about the ontology. We also write software for analysis of DNA sequencing data. We have a few things that maybe we do a little different from the others, but there's a lot of overlap with other tools as well. Uh, and then we start to work on the internet of DNA approaches, how you're going to create a sharing environment. And that's really why we joined the ERIDA consortium when it comes to how do you put this on the top of data sharing uh, environment. So let's just zoom in. Uh, so this is at 61 a This is an aminoglycoside uh, uh, enzyme. Uh, nucleoside, nucleotidal transferase. So this is the ontology term here. Uh, you have a, an ascension a synonym. So if you read the literature, you'll find three or four names get used for the same gene. So we spend a lot of time tracking that. So if you're thinking of this gene from the sense of AADE, you'll find the data. Right? We got to get that in there. There's a written definition. Uh, it's classified as an A and six. Uh, you have publications, and you get the sequence and a little bit of a detection model, which we'll get back to. On the top left is a whole classification scheme, which is the ontology, what its mechanism, what drugs it interacts with, uh, its evolutionary history. We're going to go a little bit into depth on that. But essentially, that's a, this is a, a single node or a point uh, on an ontology where you have a wealth of data uh, to it. So this is what CARD can do. It has high quality reference bases on the molecular basis of AMR. It's expert hand curated. Right? These are not algorithms generating this data. We read the literature. We go through it. We look at the quality of evidence of the MIC, the quality of the sequence call. We have rules on what gets in there as being gold standard. Breadth of data. Many of the databases are targeted. So there's some excellent TB databases. There are some excellent databases for plasmid-borne uh, AMR. We go for all of them. So we go for plasmid-borne, genomic mutation. We are pathogen agnostic. We try to get it's, it's comprehensive. It's in the title. So that's the goal. We work on advanced analytics. Because different mechanisms, different algorithms, we try to bring them all together in one package. So you can look at total resistome instead of subset. We really focus on discovery. So doing surveillance for known threats, things that we know the sequence about, is not hard. right? We can, we can teach that really quickly. But you want algorithms that say, well, in the lab, aminoglycosides, I can't explain why the aminoglycosides didn't work for that patient, that strain. We need algorithms to try and predict that, do discovery for it. And grow. So we are constantly curated. Right? Um, in particular, the low-hanging fruit mechanisms, so dedicated enzymes right, or mutations of certain targets, those are well curated by a lot of teams. But we cover things like ribosomal R mutations or operons, where you need a whole suite of genes to create phenotype. Uh, so we're really trying to curate everything. Whether we write an algorithm or not is the second question, but we curate the, the data. Yeah, in terms of that high-quality reference data, um, so this is to say that every gene in the CARD database has been um, Phenotypically verified? Yep, so you can go down to the paper and you can look at that experiment that came with it. Yep. Is that at a um, clinical resistance level? Or yeah, so like the MIC level. So uh, when it comes to mutations, particular, we, at this point, the only public data it does have clinical evidence uh, to it um, and with laboratory confirmation. There's a second level of mutation data where it's been seen in the lab, but we've never observed it in the clinic. Uh, we've been doing that with Beer Mary U, the multinational. That data uh, goes public in December, uh, according to the contract. And that's actually a long list. 
interpretation is the challenge there. Yeah. Just because it happened in the lab, you've never seen it in the clinic, are you really the first one? <laughs> right? Um, amount of MIC, right? We're going to get to that, right? So this is, in this way, so far, we're talking about qualitative knowledge. Jumping that to quantitative, to phenotype is a big leap. So we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, okay, so let's talk about ontologies, right? So uh, ARO, the antibody resistant ontology is one. So there's the food on ontology, right? There's Gen EPO, the overall effort to it. Uh, so we're just one player of many. My lab's also building a mobile ohm ontology for annotating mobile elements. So it's a controlled vocabulary codification of drugs, targets, resistance, genes, and mechanisms, right? And so you have these terms and you connect them by relationships. This gene confers resistance to this drug. Like that's a relationship. This, um, this allows computation over an AMR network knowledge, right? So maybe I want to compute from the molecules because I'm a chemist. So I pick the molecules as my entry point, but I can follow that network to get down to the genes mutations. Maybe I'm a mechanism person. I'm just cared about efflux. I can start there on the network and connect to many da data points. So it's agnostic about your point of view. I can take sequence and enter the data from that point of view. Um, so it allows not only computational network, but you're starting to build standards, right? So we can start to share data. So the goal of ARO, and it's not there yet, is to have all the databases and all the public health start to use these terms. And this is what ARIDA's goal is, to take, work with ARO and take us up to the next level, of professional grade ontology, so it starts to share data. So when I tag a data with a certain ontology term, no matter who generated it, it means the same thing, right? Um, we really developed it Scrum style, so we didn't have a lot of funding, and it was the Wild West, but now we're moving to systematic approaches uh, uh, to it, particularly working on the escape pathogens, since that's about 70% of clinical cases that are, are targeted to it. We are trying to be good computer scientists and follow the rules of ontology. I'm an engineer by heart, so I don't care about rules half the time, but now we're trying to behave nicely, right? And we were starting to build computer-assisted curation, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that. So what does an ontology look like? So this is a graph. It's a little out of date because I noticed my crew were curating this last week. So uh, at the bottom here is immunocumulin-resistant gyrase B. So all bacteria have a gyrase. Right? The wild type is sensitive to immunocurins, sensitive to fluoroquinolones, but picks up a couple of mutations and the drug bounces off, and now you're resistant to it. Um, so this relationship said this resistant form has evolved from an antibiotic sensitive gyrase B, which happens to be a topoisomerase, which is part of nucleic acid synthesis uh, targeted by antibiotic, and finally up to antibiotic target. So this is the target stream and how we evolved to not be a target. On this side, we have the chemistry side. Once we have that mutation, we're resistant to novobiosin, chlorobiosin, humoromycin, pardon me. All those are amino cumarins, leads up to antibiotic molecule. So you can connect the data from the chemistry point. From the molecular biologist, it is both an amino cumarin resistant DNA tunnel isomerase and a DNA topar isomerase subunit gyrase B. Because it's an amino cumarin resistance gene or a determinant resistance. And then you can connect a mechanism. So it is a mutation conferring antibiotic resistance. In other words, it's antibiotic target alteration. So I can enter my knowledge network from any point, either browsing the website or running an algorithm and connect down to that gyrate. So that's what an ontology does. We think about classification. We think about how to codify knowledge uh, about things. So fine, we have DNA sequencing. We build a, a, an informatic framework of reference data that's organized ontologically. How do we get to resist them? Right? And this really comes down to detection models and parameters. Now, the vast majority of tools that are out there are naive BLAST or naive burroughs wheeler transform. How similar are you to my reference? With no thought of, well, how dissimilar is still functional? If I'm 78% similar, is that still a functional protein? Right? Most of the algorithms are looking for perfect matches. So a lot of them don't even have models, a lot of the algorithms. CARD really thinks about models. So we say, well, you didn't find a perfect match to a known resistance gene, but you're within our model of being a functional homolog, right? So maybe you actually have an MIC. I can't tell you what, exactly what it's going to be. So how does that work? A large amount of data are what we call a protein homolog model. So this is evolutionary biology. So this is CTXM13. It's a beta-lactamase often found uh, transitioning from agriculture and into clinical. Uh, to it. So you can see it in pigs and humans uh, to it. It is a dedicated resistance gene. It's an enzyme. It chews up beta-lactams. So what we have is essentially the model is the sequence and a degree of similarity cutoff, a blast cutoff. What you're going to see over this summer is we're going to fade away with the, we're going to get rid of expectation values and switch to bit scores because they provide a much higher resolution for telling different proteins. 
the goal here is if I found a protein that completely matched this, that's a no-brainer. I have a CTMX13 that's functional and causes phenotype. But what if it's four amino acids away? That's probably still a functional beta-lactamase, and that's what the cutoff is around. In the case of beta-lactamase is one amino acid can change phenotype. So you got a fairly high cutoff uh, to it to say I'm, you're within the family of CTXM beta-lactamases. You're not some other hydrolase, right, because you have a degree of similarity. So we spend a lot of time curating those homologies. Every family, every enzyme, every protein has different cutoffs because their functional biology is different. The evolution of beta-lactamases is not the same as the evolution of aminoglycoside acetyltransferases. So we have to look at that and say, what's the reasonable similarity to still be likely a functional AMR, not some functional working with some other small molecule of nature? Yep. So this is all determined in silico? This is hand-curated cutoff, so we go through every one looking at similarity profiles uh, and looking at the evolution of the family and picking cutoffs. Yeah. And is there any reason, sorry, forgive me because I'm a human researcher, yeah. but is there any reason to then go back and actually test, you know, like mutate the amino acids and test the activity of the, the protein? Yeah. So, or? yeah, we're going to come to the idea of if when you find a, a, a homologue, right, something that there's no literature for that exact sequence and it's 72% similar, right. you have a judgment call to there. Uh, to, you don't have any proof. So if you ultimately really want to know if that's conferring the resistance, you need to clone it and express it and prove it. If you're just doing surveillance of likely threats, you're not going to go to the bench uh, for it. Yeah. Um, also, uh, how much does, so not only like the, the, the alignments, but um, the position of a mutation in terms of being the active site versus... Yeah. So now you're talking where we want to go, right? Okay. So right now, protein homology is really about the overall, how, how similar are you? And the bar is pretty high. Right, when you start to get dissimilar, then you got to get down into domain level analysis and docking mm -hmm. sites, etc. That's where we have to go. Where the strategy we have for that, we're not going to go there yet until we have a depth of sequencing data because that's a machine learning question. Mm -hmm. So, by building this, we encourage labs to sequence more, gather more data, more phenotypic data. When we hit depth of data, then we take machine learning and we start to actually make it an automated process back away, right? So, our genome candidate grant with Rob, that's where we want to go. We're talking about building hidden Markov models in negative space. That's sort of, right. Um, got to build this first, encourage the sequencing, get depth of data, and then we can do that. A different type of resistance. So this uh, as a TB. So TB is an exception. Almost all resistance in TB is by mutation. There's very few plasmids involved in TB. So this is a EMBB, so an ethan butanol target uh, to it. So the wild type is entirely sensitive to drug. This is the catalog of mutations that have clear evidence of elevated MIC. You pick up one or two of these mutations and you become resistance to ethambutanol. Uh, it. It's a large catalog. This one is interesting in that each mutation here stands on its own. You only need one. Many proteins, it's co-mutation. I need two or three mutations to call it. So that's even a more complex model from the analytical point of view. And the evidence gets weaker in the literature on those ones. So it gets really hard to curate. But you need a different algorithm. You not only have to find this protein, but you need to see if it's the sensitive or the resistance form. So that's a different type of model. Curating mutations, only two databases do it, us and Argonaut. Argonaut slowly throwing in the towel because it's a lot of work. I'll tell you right up front, we are miles behind on TB. Because TB has so many mutations, it's really hard for us to keep up. There, we just had a big meeting internationally. Everyone agreed we need more money just to curate TB amongst all these groups. Outside of TB, we keep up pretty strongly with mutation uh, literature. Then you move to complex models. Um, so look at glycopeptides, so resistance to vancomycin, right? This is not conferred by a single gene. What you do is you pick up a plasmid for a cluster. So this is the Van A cluster, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven genes in an operon, all must be co-expressed. There's even experimental evidence they have to be in that exact order in the genome, which I've yet to really understand how it works as a cell because the proteins don't care, right? That creates an entire biosynthetic pathway that makes a modification to the cell wall, changes permeability, changes target to it. You've got to have all of this in the right order, all the pieces, and there's a regulatory component, regulators up front. The homology has to be different. So just doing what we do is saying blast found this, this, and this, that's not good enough. So France, we work with the French government, because generally they do PCR for these three genes. If a patient lights up a PCR product on those three genes, they isolate the patient at roughly $10,000 a day. Then they go to mass spec or whatever and realize it was never expressed in the first place. Right? Scared the daylights of the patient, wasted a lot of money. 
What you want is to do genome sequencing to look at this and predict phenotype. So I never isolate that patient. That's a really hard uh, problem. You're going to look at this as a third year student who decide, why not, I'll pick a tiny project. And when it, this, we're going to see some demo in the lab of his first product of how you make a confident prediction about glycopeptide. Eflux is the same thing. So eflux, most proteins have the component of eflux proteins. It's regulation that is the issue. Is it responsive to drug? Will it upregulate them when the drug appears? That has to do with regulatory frameworks and mutations. That's really complex, the model. This level of work in eflux, nobody's modeling the phenotype. We, there's lots of algorithms to find the bits, right? But no give a, 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 a total picture. And that's what we're starting to build as CAR, to take it a step further, what we call meta-models and looking at phenotype. So where are we at? Uh, so this is updated because we're releasing today, basically. Um, just over 3,600 ontology terms, 2,300 reference sequences. There's 925 SNPs. These are clinically uh, observed and then experimentally verified SNPs. There's another 2,000 going to come on in December that are only observed in a laboratory setting or epidemiological setting. Uh, we curate over 2,000 publications, just over 2,300 AMR detection uh, models. So that's a rough estimate of how many determinants are out there, 2,300. We're a little behind on the TV. Uh, we just published uh, an undergraduate, just published first author, the, the latest card. He redes redesigned it as a third year. Um, it gets used for a number of things. People use it for genome analysis. Some of the other groups just grab the data and build models. We'll talk about ResFAMs. They use card to build ResFAMs. Quite excellent work. Uh, Fiona's group, so you look at Island Viewer, Island Viewer, they use CARD to enrich Island Viewer for AMR, so you see other databases using it to, to annotate their own data, and some use our software to predict resistance. Those usage numbers are probably out of date. Uh, from a science point of view, how do you do this effectively, right? So you need biochemists and chemists, people who know the biology, uh, and epidemiologists. You need biocurators, which is a specialist niche. Right? Someone who's got knowledge in the biological domain, the data science domain, the comp sci, who can think about how to build a model that a computer and a human can work and read a lot of papers. Right? You've got to like scholarship if you're going to do that job. Data scientists and software engineers. So the spectrum of people that they can use, we have existing tools to build a model by reading a paper, reading a suite of papers and build a model. But someone also has to write the code to use that model uh, to it. Okay, so let's do a couple case studies. So this is Jerry Wright, my colleague. Uh, so Jerry, uh, royal fellow, probably, anyone knows Jerry Wright, a few of you know Jerry. So Jerry is probably the dominant voice when it comes in antimicrobial resistance. Uh, he, he finds resistance killers. He's the leader when it comes to mechanism and discovering new drugs in chemistry. He's a, a, one of the biggest players. So five years ago, he was traveling in France, had dinner. By the time he got to Italy, he was very ill, uh, so a GI infection. Uh, in the hospital in, in Italy, multi-drug resistant infection, uh, edge of death, uh, then it was a salmonella infection. So being a good scientist, he took the sample, brought it home, we sequenced it. So this is the salmonella that infected Jerry. Uh, we ran it through the Illumina, we got the genome. And when you run it through CARD and CARD software, you come up with, this is the one visualization, the wheel. So out of the many hits, every tick here is a resistance determinant. To give you context, a drug sensitive salmonella might have two or three, right? So this is, this is a multi-resistance drug. Only one of them was a complete match to a known resistance gene. And it actually was a fairly uninteresting one on top of that. All the rest were homologous to resistance. They, our models said, hey, you're not a known sequence, but we think you're similar enough that you're causing phenotype. Uh, and there's, I can see aminoglycosides, I can see efflux, et cetera, right? The informatic challenge is, okay, this is scary. Jerry's in trouble, right? He's got a multi-resistant drug. You look at that, does that mean anything to you? It's just a bunch of gene names. Maybe you know a couple of those gene names, right? So what you want to do informatically is switch it to context. So you recode it using the ontology, and you create this inner wheel. Now I can say that perfect hit, that one gene, is an efflux protein causing chloramphenicol and beta-lactam resistance, and it actually has a regulatory component. And all those not quite perfect matches of it. If I go through and just look at the drug ones, there's chloramphenicol gone, beta-lactam's gone, polymyxin's gone, aminocumarin's gone, omega-glycoside's gone, phosphomycin's gone, muropricin, fluoroquinolone. It's a super one, right? So interpretation is the challenge. 
no matter what tools or algorithms you're going to use, you can find the genes, you can find the mutations, but you need some way to take it down to phenotype, or at least prediction of likely phenotype. Just because I've got a hit here doesn't mean they were expressed in that genome, right? That's always the, the, the issue of it. But you can break it down into drug catalogs, and seeing a wheel like this is not what I want to see. These are, this is a terrifying uh, bug to see coming. So let's talk about that. This is a surveillance. Let's step back and talk about what kind of data you're going to see and what kind of algorithms. So when we talk about this, there's really three vectors that we're thinking about. The top vector is, are we just doing perfect match screening? So I only want to do surveillance for known threats that public health has characterized that are in the literature that are in my patients, right? I don't care about what could be popping out a one in a million chance of walking in my hospital. I just want to know what's known in my community. Or am I willing to look at novel or functional variants? I said, okay, I admit I don't know enough about aminoglycoside or sudden transferases, so I want to keep my mind open that a new one might walk into the clinic. Or am I really looking for novel emergent threats? All three have different implications for algorithm. The second one is, what type of resistance? Are we going to look at dedicated resistance genes like a beta-lactamase? These are often plasmid born, right? So they're a plus minus. If you got them, you get resistance. Generally, they're expressed. They're usually expressed at high levels. They cause MIC. Or are you going to look at mutation, genomic mutation? So fluoroquinolone, aminocumarins are often mutations around ribosomal RNA or ribosomal RNA proteins uh, to it. So are we going to look at that level? Or are we going to take it further and look at uh, uh, regulation, so intrinsic resistance? I've got all the pieces. I can find them all. But is it expressed in the pathogen I've gotten at the point of infection I've got? And what is my data? Is it whole genome sequencing? Have I assembled and got a nice draft genome, nice clean data? Or is it community sequencing, short reads, messy data, with a maybe human contamination, right? So you've got to think about these three vectors. In green, <coughs> pardon me, is where the community is doing very well. Lots of software and tools can do the perfect match screening for generally important threats, plasmid-borne threats, when we do isolate sequencing. That does well. A couple are working on novel functional variants and res res resistance by mutation. Essentially, CARD and Argonaut are the two that focus on that. Novel emergence card is the only one that's thinking about that problem of building algorithms to say, I can't explain the resistance. I see what could be emergent uh, in this patient. What we are not doing well is regulatory and intrinsic resistance. I have a master's student now working on efflux because regulation is a big there because we do not predict efflux well from it. And then metagenomics. Metagenomics works well if you're looking for the dedicated genes. Do I have a high similarity to a dedicated enzyme? That works well. Completely ignores a lot of resistance, which is mutational driven. So you never do metagenomics on a TB sample because it's all mutational vision, vision and we have no algorithms for that. But even if you do metagenomics on a more run-of-the-mill pathogen, you're going to possibly miss fluoroquinolone, immunocumarin, because those are mutational based resistances uh, to it. So we got a long way to go. So when Rob and I talk about doing whole resistome prediction of metagenomics, we're thinking about both the perfect match and mutational screening with all the noise that comes with that data, that gets quite hard. <clears throat> all right, so I assigned the paper that Carr and I wrote. Uh, because the list is long, I thought that, that's, that was actually the exercise of the paper. How much is out there? It's out of date about four minutes after it got published. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of tools and databases. I put a summary to it. I wanted to highlight a couple. So tools, Argonaut. Argonaut is basically uh, CARD's closest competitor and collaborator. We talk regularly, and the, and the two of us work with NCBI on, NCBI on a regular basis around curation. It uh, does very well, uh, both for SNPs and dedicated resistance gene. ResFinder is actually a great little tool for plasmid-borne resistance, right? And we again, we collaborate. There's basically 100% overlap between Argonaut, CARD, and ResFinder on uh, dedicated resistance gene. We wrote the RGI. We're going to demo that. Uh, I highlight SEER, which is a nice uh, draft pipeline for metagenomics. We're going to try a different one today called AMR++ uh, to it. Um, and then I highlight one at the bottom, TB profiler. So who works on TB? Anyone? Yeah. So TB, worst case scenario right now in bioinformatics. TB is all mutational based. No one's keeping up with curation of data. So it doesn't matter how good their algorithm is. Their underlying reference data is incomplete, and these guys will admit it. So I was in a meeting in Germany where the six labs that were generating TB bioinformatics resources for AMR, and they all admitted they were behind schedule on curation, and their data sets didn't overlap. 
So there's a real problem. This is a great little algorithm. It screens for, at that time, 1,325 mutations, which is definitely less than there are in TB in a clinical setting. What I like that one is you can add your own data as reference pretty easily to it. So if you know even mutations that are in your community, you can add it to TBB uh, profile. Databases, Argonaut and CARD, I kind of already covered. Uh, we, we, you know, European and Canadian. Uh, similar effort to it. Someday we need one. Hopefully, when we build the ontology, we'll just start merging and be one database at some point. Um, NCBI. So NCBI. Um, Basically, beta-lactamases, which there's a thousand or more, uh, it was two elderly scientists curating the nomenclature and the data, and they really wanted to retire. So NCBI took this over. So right now, NCBI is the home for naming beta-lactamases. And through sequencing, we find many per week, right? A single mutation can change MIC for a beta-lactamase. They also have their uh, resistance reference gene database, which is essentially NCBI's version of CARD. Um, but that means it's now integrated into NCBI's annotation format if you're in the U.S. government system, right? So EPA, USDA, this is where they get their reference data. It flows from CARD and Argonaut and ResFAMS, collaborates with NCBI and NCBI packages and puts it out uh, to, to the various American agencies, right? Um, and that was a quiet negotiation over the last sort of five years uh, to make sure that works well. So NCBI is starting to really do some heavy lifting. NCBI as well is now going to soon push editors to make, if you publish on AMR, you've got to submit the MIC data to NCBI. So every gen genotype is going to have an, MC, an MIC connected to it. So you're going to see an editorial drive. Just like when it became mandatory that you had to submit sequence to GenBank if you want to publish, soon it'll be sequence plus MIC. So this is a really good thing. <coughs> um, ResFinder, so this just simply does the acquired genes. Really nice, tight little tool. ResFAMS is, we're going to talk a little bit about ResFAMS. So ResFAMS takes CARD and it builds hidden Markov models. So they look at functional domains now. Um, there's some great papers mining metagenomic data with the ResFAMS, computationally intensive work. Really, this is not boutique analysis. This is heavy stuff. But that allows is it's a big open window for functional diversity. It, it has a big, it says, well, you're not similar, but I really think you're a beta-lactamase. Trouble is it also bleeds into the hydrolases, into the others, because it's really the functional domain. The false discovery rate is a little uncertain uh, to it, but it really gives you a, a broad swath that, well, here's a big list of things that could be beta-lactamases or acetyl transferases. Um, quite powerful for discovery. It's just we really don't know what the false positive uh, rate in that database. I'm going to talk a little bit about ResFAMS uh, in a second. Okay. okay. So software. So we're going to use RGI as just one example. It shares a lot in common with other software. So we engineered the RGI going back to the black swan. And we're going to analyze, in this case, isolate data. We want to look for perfect, or the known knowns, so the threats we understand. Right? I want to see those, don't want to miss them. But I also want to have what we call strict, the known unknowns, that you are within a functional range of similarity to a known gene. So you're a new acetyl, aminoglycosidocytic so transferases. Those are those hand curated cutoffs. And then we have the loose discovery, that when I have phenotype I can't explain, go outside my models. What could explain it? So we call that the unknown unknown for discovery. Only a very small number of researchers care about this. Either they're drug discovery people, or they've got something in the clinic they can't explain. Right? That's when they turn on that algorithm. Most of you will never have need for loose discovery. Let's hope from your patient's point of view, you'll never have any uh, loose discovery. So this is a sample. Uh, we're sequencing a 1,000 samples uh, in our hospitals. Generally, kids come in any type of multi-drug. So it's got to fail three drugs before we see it. Could be anything. Could be lung. Could be tissue. Could be gut. Um, this is a Kleb sample that came in, pediatric. Uh, we sequenced it. And this individual had three known genes, two amino glycoside and one beta-lactam resistance gene. Those are, uh, are in the green. And then a large suite of ones that we thought were strict functional homologs. Right? Now, when we looked at the antibiogram and we looked at this list, we could match it. We could figure it out. There was no unexplained resistance uh, to it. But if there was, if we looked at and said, well, we can't explain with that list of strict and purpose. Here's the strict and perfect broken down by function, both by mechanism and drug class. But say I still couldn't understand why macrolides didn't work in this patient and on this strain. Then I'd go into loose, and I would find the category for macrolides, all classified by the arrow, and see how many hits I've got. So if we look at, say, fluoroquinolone, there's 66 hits in the loose. So kind of back to your question, right? So if you can't explain phenotype and you go into loose, you've got 66 genes to clone. 
to make any proof. This is discovery, right? There's, these are outside our homology models. It's, they could be working with some other small molecule entirely, right? But it's a stark point. We blinded card, so we took the MCR1 and the NDM1, but we took those models out of card, threw those genomes through, and they showed up right at the top of the loose hit. So we feel pretty good at that. I'm not going to overclaim. There's other classes that are really hard for loose to do well. It does really well for beta-lactamases. I'm not too worried. If a new beta-lactamase pops out, I'll see it. Other enzyme get, gets even tougher uh, to do so. New mutations, you need, you need a cohort study. You need much more information to do new mutations. So RGI, we're going to see this interface. Yeah. It has both a web and a command line. We're going to use the web today, but you can download, use it as high throughput at the command line with your data. Uh, RGI was designed for whole genomes or assembly context, so isolate work, right? Um, so it uses blastlase homology plus SNP mapping. Um, it's very effective based on CARD's canonical reference sequences, things that are in the literature and well designed. But what about metagenomics, right? So we heard from Fiona, we have the AMR time, AMR time with Rob to work on extending this paradigm into metagenomics. The key is I want you to understand what the problems are with metagenomics. So we've got canonical reference sequences, the published diversity of sequences that someone did a lab a study with to prove, right? That's a very small sample of the real diversity of functional proteins that are out there. So we're up under representing nucleotide sequencing of diversity of AMR genes in the wild clinic farm environment. Most um, algorithms do metagenomics use the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. What that does is high similarity, high similarity nucleotide matching. You've got to have a nice tight fit to line it up against the reference. But if your reference is not big enough, you'll miss. You could have a resistance gene in your sample that is in the wild, never been seen before, never been published before. Therefore, it won't have a high stringency map to CARD because CARD doesn't curate that level of data. So you have a high false negative rate when you use the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. We're going to do a study with AMR tonight, time today, uh, AMR++, plus plus, um, which we're going to do this Burroughs-Wheeler's transform alignment of raw metagenomic data against you know, it's their version of CARD. But again, if there's novel stuff in there that has is functional but not the slightly different sequence space, it's going to miss. So this is the number one challenge to it. Also, when you do Burroughs-Wheeler transform, you're just saying high similarity, 98%. You're not doing any SNP checking at all. Right? So you're ignoring that whole component of resistance. So if you see a paper or an algorithm saying, I'm analyzing, I predicted resistome from metagenomics by Burroughs-Wheeler's transform, by definition, they've ignored whole suites of resistance that are mutational based. And that's why it's useless for TB, for example. So there are no algorithms now that do both homology and SNP assessment of metagenomic. That's what our Genomes Canada grant. We want to predict the whole package, not just the partial package. So if you're in the metagenomics world, keep that in mind. You're going to under-represent. Uh, so how does that look? So if we look at three sort of methods for, for metagenomics. So what we just talked about now, the Burroughs-Wheeler's transform and read mapping on one end. The res farms, which look at functional domains and very divergent homology, really open point of view, or maybe even just blast X. You take that short read of 250 base pairs, you blast exits against card. That allows some sequence diversity. So at this end, you have a high false positive rate. Markov models, by definition, reach long, right? So you don't know. You got to really, it's going to generate a long list of hits, and you got to look at how good those hits. And there's no rules on saying where the break is from a functional beta lactamase to a hydrolase that's doing something else on the side. Blast X, we use blast in card where we've curated cutoffs for whole proteins. All that breaks down once you have fragments of proteins. So there are no paradigms for the cutoff of BLASTX. You can always generate a BLASTX hit. Does that mean it's a functional MRR protein? At the other end, with the Birozulian transform, you're being high stringency. So we've got an un under curated reference set. We don't know sequence diversity in the wild, so we're going to have a higher false negative rate. So it really isn't a good answer uh, yet to it. And I said all these methods are ignoring SNPs. And so you've, by definition, you're ignoring SNPs. So this is where we are in metagenomics. All right, so let's look a little bit at scale. Um, this is genomic, but it has implication for metagenomics. There's a study we published of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in just shy of 300 CF patients in Canada. Uh, these are isolated uh, to it. Every row is a distant resistotype. Most of them were only seen in one isolate. A few of them were seen in more than one isolate, the histogram uh, at the top. 
every row is a different resistance gene. So you can see there's a lot of resistor type in Canadian CF patients for, pseudo, for uh, pseudomonas originals. If it's green, it's a perfect match to a known threat, right? If it's red, it's within strict. It's a new sequence variant. So the number one conclusion was there's a lot of underappreciated sequence diversity in clinical CF patients for pseudomonas aeruginosa. That has immediate implications for doing metagenomic lung sequencing because our reference is missing all those red dots. And metagenomics needs high similarity reference data if you're going to do Brewer's Wheeler transform. So the challenge we saw that is, oh my God, taking card and starting to get you know, spit in the cup and let's do metagenomic sequencing as CF patient is going to break down because of this. And then we see a lot of things. There were some gene classes that everybody had. Most of them were to efflux. So those are regulatory questions. Uh, they had the efflux protein. Is it turned on is a whole separate question, which our algorithm doesn't ask. Then you had some interesting ones. A few isolates that had very different resistance protiles that you hopefully won't spread uh, at that point. So now we go to look to see if that was maybe was a plasmid, uh, those type of concerns. This study was interesting, had some uh, implications that there was a lot of similarity among CF strains, but a lot of interesting one-off strains, but a lot of underappreciated functional sequence diversity. But we got criticized. Uh, a group in Brazil said, your software sucks. Uh, <laughs> you really are not helping Brazil at all. We have, uh, Brazil does have uh, an endemic uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa strain. We undercalled phenotype completely on this uh, paper, so they put out a comment. Uh, so we looked at it, and what we found is that RGI has false negatives for a Brazilian epidemic strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so it did not work well for Brazilians. Um, it was not a failure of our algorithms. RGI, the algorithm, ran perfectly fine. It was a fail of curation at the card. So the beta-lactamase SPM1, we had added the term to the antibiotic resistance ontology, but the curators had yet to build a model for it, so there was nothing for the software to use. But yet, when it came to bicyclomycin, which is a drug used in Brazil, not often used in Canada, we hadn't even entered the drug into CART yet. They were, we'd missed them to it. So no reference data, no hits to it. So, you know, we curated it that afternoon. By that evening, it was in there. We emailed the Brazilians. We're very sorry. Right? But what was the problem? <clears throat> the problem was that curation is a labor-intensive human effort, expert human curators. So generally, there are anywhere from students to technicians reading papers, building models in CART, following a few rules. The reference sequence must be published, must have a GenBank accession. There must be clear evidence of resistance of an experiment underneath it. There's a lot of papers, right? So they missed Brazil entirely, right? So what we've done now is we wrote an algorithm called Card Shark. Again, these are two undergraduate second year. So who plays poker? Anyone? So Card Shark is you're shuffling the deck, and as you're doing, you're doing sleight of hand, so the card you want ends at the top. So you get that card next. That's what a card shark does, right? So what card shark does is every third days it reads PubMed, all of PubMed, shuffles the deck, and puts the most valuable paper at the top. That's the first one the curator reads. It basically says, what paper should you read next? Right? By using card as a network of knowledge, the ontology, and building a, a text mining algorithm around it, and it reweights it. So we went in, and we ran card shark. Uh, once we got it going, then what, guess what came up first? The two Brazilian hits were right in the top ten, right? Uh, plus an interesting beta-lactamase family, which we missed entirely because it was in Fowl in India. Uh, so, so this is one thing. You need to do this infrastructure. When I'm, my home is, you know, none of you are going to be biocurators like us, but if your biocuration pipeline is not good, you're going to have bad reference data, you're going to get bad results, right? So next time you're at a CHR panel, tell them biocurators need to deserve more money. Uh, to it, right? So card shark is helping. It's and hurting because it finds so many papers we can't keep up. Right? TB is the one who loses uh, on this on this side. So let's scale up further. Surveillance. So Syria, right? So Newsweek, it was Newsweek, put out this paper about the Syrian crisis is going to maybe be the end of antibiotics, right? So you deal with crisis. You deal with so Haiti after you know with cholera. You look at. War zones, refugee camps, you get use and misuse or unable to properly use antibiotics, right? You get shrapnel, which picks up strange bacteria out of soil, acinobacter strains. We have bad strains that came out of British combat vets, came out of soil, right? So we have this issue that this global problem, one crisis in Syria could breed new, a new environment to breed new resistance becomes what we call the discovery zone, right? Because these people are going to get on airplanes, the physicians get airplanes, they could show up in Manitoba, you name it. So this is why we need a discovery algorithm. 
So really, what will informatics need to look like when we sequence every hospital, clinic, or outbreak, or war zone? Um, how do we build a surveillance network for drug resistance? So these are just the last couple slides. So the, you've heard a little bit about these Genome Canada grants with ARIDA. So uh, Will Zhao has one grant, really build a, a just push ontologies way further to build this world. Rob has a second grant to say, well, how are we going to deal with messy data and metagenomics for this world to build this surveillance? So the Canadian government is starting to put some serious money uh, in this to work on this problem. But I'm going to highlight this comes down to the other re revolution. The first revolution was sequencing, right? We could take advantage of that. It's a market force that we don't need to worry about. It gets cheaper and faster and smaller every day. You have the Internet of Things, right? Sequencers are plugged into the Internet. They're getting smaller. We got nanopores that go on the end of, you know, cell phones uh, now to it. So just as like you can in the States, you can buy a smart milk bottle that tells you that, hey, the milk just went sour, or the kid drank it, or you got shoes that are tracking your steps, etc. Uh, the hope is that as we build these informatics resources, better reference, beta, better data sharing and ontologies, we start embedding sequencing as a technology in the neighborhood clinic, right? So being a Canadian, think about the North, right? If you're a child in the North who is breathing poorly, right, you get a sample, a sputum sample, it's shipped to the South, it's TB, so it takes two weeks to culture, characterize, maybe it's four to six weeks before the report comes back that there's a new strain of TB, right? Meanwhile, the community is infected with it. Instead, if you make sequencing and DNA isolation technology cheaper, the, the physician's assistant, whoever's there in that clinic in the north, gets in the spit in the cup, spins it down, runs it through a nanopore, and 40 seconds later, the federal PHAC gets in a warning because an algorithm said, hey, that's a new strain of TB. It has a, a mutation that we think is functional we've never seen. So I'm an industrial chair. That's my job to get industry and government to, to come to that, that side of the equation. So why would you want to do this? Um, so the first one is what Fiona's great curve she showed last night, right? The earlier you detect, the earlier you get rapid response, the less disease and mortality you get, rapid response. So that's what we want to build out of the sequencing world. Early detection of emergent threats, right? Depth of data, we talked about, now you get better at predicting emergence. So when you sequence that thing that picked up a brand new beta-lactamase or whatever, the algorithm warns you, said, hey, what was that protein? That protein worries me. Go clone it, look at it now, because I think that's going to be a problem in your community. Inform public policy. As I said, you can't really say in Canada which resistance genes are around and what's their density and frequency. We know what the resistance is around, phenotypically, but we don't know the underlying genes and mechanisms. With that in place, we can get better data, right? The earlier we know there's a completely drug resistance of a strain of gonorrhea, the more we can inform, go to high school and do public education, etc. right? Uh, we can guide clinical practice. So physicians don't need me. Physicians know what they're doing. They know what resistance in their community. They know roughly how to treat their patients. Where physicians struggle is when they have a patient that's resistant to one drug. So now they're down to four. They know which one's most effective clinically with the least side effects for their patient. But they don't know which of the four has least likely to cause a community problem, to create more resistance. So which one should they prescribe that will save their patient, but also have the least risk of creating more resistance in the future? So that's antibiotic stewardship. So when we gather this level of data, we can actually hit that. Say, well, drug number four, there's no resistance genes in your community for that one. That's the drug I want you to use, because there's no resistance elements that you're going to favor. Or maybe that's the one I hold in reserve, because we don't want to create resistance for that one. So we need that data. Then the last one's my sweet spot. Targeted drug development. So there's only two companies really doing antimicrobial development. We're not going to get a lot of new drugs, right? There will be some. The future is actually in resistance killers, drugs that turn off resistance. So you can go back to using your old drugs. So Jerry Wright, who I showed, has developed a resistance killer to NDM1. So when you put his killer in the cocktail, NDM1 shut off, you can go back to using your carbapenems, things that that drug, that gene usually takes off that. So resistance killers are a big part. But if you're a small startup or a medium-sized biotech company and you said, I think I have a resistance killer for the AACs, go to the federal government and say, well, you know, AAC genes, is that 2% of your patients, 80% of your patients, is it pediatric, is it like, I need this data to build a business model and get investors and bring this drug to market. We have no data. They won't risk. So by having this data, sequence surveillance, I produce a data set to de-risk the drug development pipeline. So they can go, wow, that's 80% of pediatric patients. We can get this through trials and still make product, profit before the patent wears out. Or, no, that's not the case. We've got to do it as a non-profit with the federal government and bring the drug to market that way. No data, no risk-taking. So that's where I want to go. So I'm actually going to show you a real example of that. 
And this is kind of some of the algorithms you're going to see in the lab. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> this is called our wildcard algorithms. So this goes to that metagenomics problem. So wildcard takes card and RGI and runs it against GenBank. Everything else there. Finds all the perfect and hits. So there's a whole bunch of gram negatives uh, here, mostly escapes. Every red tick, every row is a different resistance gene, and a red tick is how prevalent. So a faint red tick, you can barely see there. It means that it's, it only shows up in a couple isolates, you know, 3%, 4%. So bright red tick says, wow, it's in almost all the isolates for that strain. So there's a lot of resistance drugs, and this is a perfect algorithm, right? So this is a perfect match to known threats. We get all these, and you can see, of course, every pathogen has it in the community-wise, it's a different repertoire of resistance genes. But if we focus in on the aminoglycosidocytal transferases, because Jerry Wright's trying to find killers for these to shut these down, and I look at prevalence, I have perfect hits to a lot of them rarely, but three of them in fairly high abundance, two of them actually in multiple pathogens. Those are the ones that I want to develop a resistance killer because those ones are prevalent in what's in GenBank, assuming GenBank is a decent sample. People don't sequence boring stuff, so probably a good example. The reason we're sequencing 1,000 patients is I want a, a non-biased analysis to that. So Jerry went to the lab and said, fine, let's go find killers to AAC6 primes by doing high through robotic screening, right? A 6 prime means that the AAC modifies the 6 prime position on the aminoglycoside, right? Um, Acetylase. So Jerry started spending money doing all that. And I said, well, well, slow down. Let's run a wild card, but let's take the perfect and the strix. Right? So not only the complete matched and known sequences, but what our algorithms say are all the functional variants. And a lot more things start to write up, light up red. There is an underappreciated sequencing di sequence diversity out there, which is why metagenomics fails. And you look at the AACs, and here's the three that Jerry originally did, and they even get better. Now we get some strict, strict hits as well in other pathogens. So good. Keep going after these ones. Jerry, keep those. Those are good ones as resistance killers. But right at the top, where are a highly prevalent group of AAC3s. So they modify a different position of the amino glycoside, right? This is a slightly different enzyme. It's only about 70% similar to the one Jerry's trying to shut down. And it's quite prevalent only at strict level. So there's a completely underappreciated sequence diversity of AAC3 sitting out there in clinical specimens that GenBank has in it, right? They've never been characterized. They've never made it into the literature. No one's done an MIC on them. But they're quite prevalent. Right? And this requires a completely different chemical screen than those to find a resistance killer. So Jerry's going to clone those, right? see if they really produce MIC. And if they really do MIC, he'll publish a paper saying, hey, look, there's a whole other threat from AACs that we don't appreciate, the AAC3s. And then he's going to screen and try to find a killer for those as well. This is the type of data environment that we want to build. Uh, I'm going to skip by the frequently asked. You can, they'll come up for sure in the lab. Um, so challenges. So if you're going to do AMR, if you're going to do virulence factors, right, whatever you're annotating in your data, whether it be AMR and virulence factors, it comes down to high quality reference data. Uh, the virulence factor DB hasn't been updated in about three years, right? So there's, there's your warning flag right, right there that your reference data ages. Um, our agencies, NIH, CHR, they don't fund biocuration very well, but we all need it, right, to it. Um, the trouble with AMR is it's not static. It evolves on a weekly basis. So it's not like annotating the zebrafish genome, which I helped do, and then you're done. Because it doesn't evolve on a daily basis. But this does. So unlike traditional bicuration, we're, we're not annotating static genome. It's a target that's moving. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be increasing an increasing amount of data at the level of clinic or farm. So we need data sharing dairy storage. That's what the ontologies are about. Metagenomics is difficult and computationally costly. So as a result, we're only analyzing the, the easiest subsets of AMR, right? Burroughs, Wheeler, Transform type things that are fast. Up to it. And translational tools are increasingly needed. So that's why I'm actually showing web. So Galaxy came up last night. Who knows what Galaxy is or is familiar with the Galaxy framework? Uh, so I'm going to stick in a Galaxy demo this afternoon. Uh, too. So <clears throat> if you don't want to use command line, Right? You have a, a technician who is doing their poor job is they got to do all the culture, sequence, and annotate. You don't want to teach them command line. You want a translational tool. Right? Why aren't we doing well? So back to your question. Minimum inhibitory endorsed data is not curated in any of these databases. Right? So CARD may tell you that this gene has a relationship that confers resistance to this drug, but I don't give you context what the MIC is in E. coli, what the MIC is in staff, what the MIC is in those, right? 
that data is not being claimed. GenBank is now going to formalize that, hopefully it comes. Kind of what we get at the end, prevalence matters, right? So the drug discovery prevalence matters. You want to go after the things that are common threats, not just every hit that the RGI uh, matters. But prevalence is another one. So if you analyze GenBank, there's some associations that are 100%. I always see these four genes in every pathogen, no matter how many times. They're not functionally related, they're just always there. If I shotgun a sequence, shotgun sequence a genome really thinly, so it's got lots of gaps, right, the, that Will talked about, and I see three of them, just by probability, the force probably there, I just didn't sequence it, right? That's called prevalence. So you can make smart algorithms based on prevalence data. Say, well, you really sequenced that thinly, but you saw one, two, and three, so I'm predicting you probably have four as well. That's it to explain to you about that. Plasmids and other aspects of the mobilome are really undercurated, even though they're the most critical part of AMR in many well. Um, my lab is starting on that with the gen EPO and doing mobile loans. Um, <clears throat> and then all the metadata. So that goes to the MICs, but more of that, you know, point of infection uh, source of it. Everything, if you can do some type of meta-analysis to predict, hey, this new SNP is causing the phenotype uh, to it, you need as much metadata. It's really inconsistent. So Fiona talked a, little, a lot about that last night. The exact same challenges. All right, so that is perfect. We're on time. Um, so I'm just going to do my thanks. So Jerry and uh, McMaster and the CARB Dead Team Consortium, Gen EPO uh, and ARIDA, um, and all the CARD, CARD and I. So McMaster and Cisco, Cisco uh, under sort of funds my lab and helps build this. Sightline is one of those machine learning companies just waiting for us to generate more, enough data. That's where they want their marketplace. Uh, NML and ARIDA, huge partners in this. USDA, NCBI, Beer and then a whole suite of academic collaborators uh, to get this together. Any questions? Perfect. Good. Answered the questions in the middle. Rob. Yeah. So the AAC, AAC3 Yeah, so that's totally what's missing in there. Is, is, so that, <clears throat> pardon me, lose my voice, but if we go back to those AC3s and they're all plasmid born, that's an extra signal of it's a real legitimate threat, right? If they are reasonably homologous to settle transferases and they're sitting in the chromosome, they could be interacting with other small molecule to it. So that's context is everything, interpretation is everything. Our algorithms are not doing that sufficiently. So we've been in the background playing with how do we predict whether a contig is a plasmid contig or not. So we could make that secondary to it. The prevalence comes down to that too. If you know that based on wildcard that these genes are always plasmid born, you can get that level of data analytically to say, when I analyze this isolate, I'm calling that a plasmid because it's never seen in a non-plasmid setting. But right now I can't make that call. The, the identities are pretty high, so I'm, I'm thinking they're probably functional. Okay, coffee break.